The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. What's up, everyone? Welcome into episode 37 of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factor Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This week's guest is the great modern jazz drummer, Jonathan Blake. Jonathan has been in the cutting edge, the top of the game of the modern jazz scene. My gosh, I guess he started in the mid to late 90s with Roy Hargrove and then later joined up with the Mingus Band, which led to many collaborations. Most recently, you can catch him on the road with Kenny Barron. He's got some gigs with him coming up. Uh, Bill Frizzell, Maria Schneider. He also leads his own band. He just put out a great record. So check out his own discography under his own name, Jonathan Blake. Check out his records. This is a fun conversation. We talk about everything from his upbringing in Philly, um, kind of studying under his father, and then his mentors around town, and then moving to New York. Uh, And then we talk about his gear. He's got a very interesting setup. So we talk about that. It's a fun conversation. So let's, uh, let's dive in. Here's Jonathan Blake. Uh, well, you just kind of threw something out there before we started recording. I f- didn't realize that you played violin first. That was your in- yeah. first instrument. So your yeah. dad, world famous jazz violinist. Um, yeah. Did you choose to play violin, or was it just handed to you? Uh, you know, I wanted to play it actually. You know, yeah. uh, you know, I grew up watching my father play in, in various settings. You know, when I was born, he was touring with uh, Grover Washington Jr. Um, and you know, Grover was big on having families travel with with the band. Mm. So we were going to places very early on, you know, I was going to see him in California. And, um, and you know, I was always captivated by music. Um, and then he started playing with McCoy uh, in, in the late 70s, like 79 and through the early 80s. And I was also traveling, traveling with him, you know, quite a bit during there. So, yeah, music was always a big part. So. Yeah, I wanted to play at a very early age. And, you know, he was my first teacher. I I received my first instrument uh, when I was three years old. Mm. And given, he began giving me lessons. And then I also started taking lessons um, with the Settlement Music School, which is uh, a bunch of different music schools throughout the um, Philadelphia area and uh, all different boroughs of, of Philly. So, um yeah, so I studied at the Germantown branch because I was living in uh, Germantown with my folks. So yeah, that that was my uh, that was my first instrument. But you know, I remember early on I was always fascinated with rhythm, and um, I used to take my mom's pots and pans and kind of spread them across the floor and take these metal spoons that we had and start you know beating out rhythms that I would hear on the radio or if my father was playing something on on the stereo. So uh, eventually they finally broke down <laughs> and, and uh, got me drum lessons um, and eventually a drum set. But the, uh, the prerequisite for that was that I had to uh, learn piano. You know? I was just about to ask you, did you study? Yeah, yeah. Man, he was sending you down the path, right? You yeah, got a yeah, yeah. instrument, you got piano and you got rhythm yeah. all at once. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he said, look, if you want to take if you want to take these drum lessons and, and get a drum set, we have to set you up with piano lessons. And, you know, as a young kid, you don't really want to do it. But if the end result is getting getting you what you want to do, you'll do what you have to do. So <laughs> I want to play drums. So I was like, all right, if I'm going to play drums, I got to I got to do these piano lessons. So I started taking piano lessons and it and it proved to be so helpful later on because it's it's really helped me with my writing you know, I compose mostly at the piano when I'm when I'm writing music. Um, so just to have that that step ahead of the game, so to speak, uh, with being able to um, identify chords and and learn about harmony, I you know I have to credit him for for you know pushing me to do that. So yeah, was this strictly uh, classical lessons? Yeah, mainly classical lessons. I didn't really start taking jazz piano until. Actually, until uh, college, actually, maybe, you know, mm. uh, when I had to take like a, a independent uh, piano class. So, yeah, it was, you know, it was mostly it was mostly classical, it was, you know, studying. I got really heavily into like uh, Bartok. And, mm-hmm. and, and um, so we had a, I had a book of all like uh, Bartok music and my and my uh, teacher at the time was 
was playing me through all these different uh, pieces of bar talk, and I just fell in love with it. Love, love with his compositions. So. Wild. Yeah. Did you maintain all three instruments, or when did drums kind of take over? Uh, so I maintained all three up until um, in my second year in high school, and then I kind of said I don't want to play violin anymore, mm-hmm. and I really want to concentrate on on percussion and, and and drums. So I was taking mallets. I was learning vibes and, and mallets and still taking piano lessons and, and, and drum lessons. So, uh, yeah, so sophomore and I would say sophomore year of, of high school, that's when I kind of just started to focus on the two, the two, um, the two instruments, uh, piano and, and drums. And was, was jazz music always the music you wanted to play? Or, I mean, I know it's, you're probably hearing it a bunch. When did it become your focus? Yeah, I was hearing it. I was hearing it a bunch. Um, I don't think it really uh, took over me until uh, probably like around uh, eighth grade. Mm-hmm. And by high, and yeah, so eighth grade, like eighth grade, junior high, because um, throughout middle school, throughout sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, that's when I first started playing in the um, the the quote unquote jazz band. They would call it stage band, mm-hmm. and, and that's when we were playing. You know these you know, these arrangements of, you know, Duke Ellington and various other big bands, but also like kind of like more smaller group stuff too. So that's when I started really getting into the music. I also uh, played in a youth ensemble outside of school in Philadelphia, which was uh, run by a gentleman uh, and is still currently run by a gentleman named Lovett Hines. And Lovett Hines was like, is a world renowned teacher and he's uh, and really known in, in Philadelphia, he's like a, uh, you know, he's like a hero in, in, uh, in, the, in that scene in Philadelphia. So he's taught everybody from uh, Joey DeFrancesco to Christian McBride, Rob Landham and Byer Landham, Jaleel Shaw, um, Orrin Evans. We all kind of came out of that out of that school. So that really inspired me because that there I was meeting people my age who were kind of getting started and, 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 and liking the same type of music that I was starting to check out. So yeah, that was around eighth grade. And by high school, I was like, all right, I know this is what I want to do. You know, mm-hmm. this is, you know, this is, this is the path that I'm, that I'm going to take. So, yeah. Who were your early drum set mentors? Um, early on, it was all cats from Philly, you know, mm-hmm. it was, it was the cast that I was studying with, uh, uh, Mickey Roker was still alive. Um, I was studying with him. Great drummer by the name of Edgar Bateman. Um, that not a lot of people know about. I was I was playing with him. I was studying with him. Um, uh, uh, who else? Oh, Bobby Dorham was still was still around in Philly. I was studying with him a little bit. You know, they all kind of took me under the wing. And then um, Mainly, mainly Mickey and and another gentleman, Ralph Peterson Jr., who we lost uh, last year, was was uh, had taken me and I started studying with the both of them, and it was just amazing. And maybe a bit earlier than them, where it was a drummer named um, Leon Jordan. Um, so, yeah, I was studying with a bunch of people, um, and also another gentleman by the name of Carl Matola, who was um, who was a great big band drummer, but also um, you know, he kind of knew all the, like the top 40 stuff, but he also did, um, you know, he also, from Carl really helped me with my, uh, with my reading and sight reading because he mm-hmm. could read anything. He was, he was great. So, you know, those four or five drummers, those are the cats that were really checking out. Um, Mickey played a weekly gig at Ortlieb's Jazz House in Philly mm-hmm. uh, with, with Shirley Scott, uh, sometimes with Trudy Pitts. So I was going down, you know, on the, on the weekends to, to see him live. So, uh, yeah, I, those, they, those drummers really became heavily, um, inspira- you know, heavy inspirations on me. So, mm-hmm. uh, and then, you know, of course, later on, I, you know, I fell in love with Elvin Jones. I got to meet him when I was about 14. And he became one of my idols, one of my favorite drummers still to this day. Uh, I got to meet Tony Williams and he was another one of my heroes. Uh, but I would say most, you know, early, my early influences were definitely like the, the Philly drummers. Cause mm-hmm. I felt like even back then, I felt like Philly drummers had a certain sound about, 
uh, with the way they approach playing, you know? So, uh, you know, hearing Philly Joe Jones, but also just like hearing those, hearing, you know, those drummers I mentioned, they all had a certain thing about it that was, was unique Mm -hmm. to the sound of Philadelphia that was different from, you know, the style of New Orleans drummers or the style of, you know, of, 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 uh, you know, New York style drummer. You know, it was just a different sound. So I kind of just gravitated to that because that's what I was hearing all the time. It's funny you say that. I mean, I I was fortunate to go hang with Mickey a few times when I lived in town. And yeah, the feel was unmistakable. Interestingly, I kind of identify you as having a New York sound. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that's, funny. that's funny. I mean, I, I definitely, I mean, I think spending so much time here and living here, you know, you definitely adapt. But, uh, you know, it's it's in there for sure. The Philly thing is definitely in there because it was I was soaked in it for so long. You know, so just, how would you define it? I think of New York as being kind of more front edge leaning feel. How would you define the Philly vibe? Philly vibe. I had so I had somebody do an interview one time and they said it's like this vibe of. Of kind of feeling behind a beat, but but also playing like you're you're not in a hurry to get to the next beat, but you you know, but it's like you you kind of feel that urgency. It's it's a weird thing, but that's mm. how they kind of explain it. it's like like that urge of getting to the next beat, but not really. You know, so that's kind of what I, you know, when I think about Mickey, he had this forward motion, but it was so relaxed. And yeah. it was the same thing with with Edgar. Like they had that motion, like when you would hear Edgar, nothing would would deviate his ride symbol. Like he could play whatever he wanted in his left hand on the snare. But that riot symbol was always pushing, but it always felt so relaxed. It didn't feel like, oh man, they're rushing. Like you, it wasn't like a nervous energy. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's that's I don't know. That's the best way I can explain. It. That's kind of like the feel that I that I heard early on that I gravitated to. So let me. So you said it's oh man on the front of the beat, but you're not in a hurry to get there. Is that what you yeah, said? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's it's, it's a funny, uh, and, and it's true, because I, I, I forget, I think it was this cat from NPR, John Murphy, who said that. And I was like, man, that's that's perfect, because mm. that's, that's, that's how I remember it. You know, like when I would hear them, I was like, man, it's just like, it's dance. It's like, you know, it's on top of the beat, you kind of feel it, but it does, it's not like, oh, my God, it's nervous energy. No, it's just like, it's there. You feel it, but it's mm. like you feel it coming, but you don't want it to happen yet. You know, so it's, it's I love that. I love that feeling. So I kind of took that with me. And then, you know, of course, being influenced by, you know, the drummers in New York and the cats that I was hearing in New York, it definitely, you know, we're definitely a product of what we, you know, what we are exposed to. So when you first got to town, did you feel like, oh, man, I've got to I've got to start pushing? Like, was the feel like really edgy by comparison? Yeah, it was a different, it was, it was a definitely a different feel. Like I, I felt like, oh shoot, I can't be as relaxed as I would like, you know, like it was, it was this sense of urgency and it was like, oh, okay. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta match that energy. Mm-hmm. Cause it was like, I felt like, oh, if I don't, I'm going to get run over. It was like, you were playing with cats that like commanded a certain thing. And it was like, mm-hmm. you know, my first, my first major gig was, um, Playing with playing with Roy Hargrove actually, like in mm. like the mid nineties, like ninety five or ninety six when I moved up, you know, I moved to New York, I think in ninety five, ninety four, ninety five, and the ninety six I started doing some gigs with Roy. And that was a different energy. I mean, I, we we were rehearsed and he would immediately call it out. No man, it's drag, you gotta push it, you gotta push it. Mm. And this was coming after like uh Greg Hutchinson, who, you know, when we talked later on, he talked about that because he talked about playing in a band with uh, Rodney Whitaker and Rodney would always get on him about like, man, why are you, why are you playing behind the beat? And he would be like, man, why are you rushing? And, you know, and it was like, <laughs> oh, y'all have to find that, you know, and he kind of, you know, he credits Rodney for like showing him how to play a little bit more on, you know, with that edge. And, you know, Roy, of course, got used to that. So like when I came in there, it was like, no, you got to step up. No, it's, mm. it's you, can't, you can't, you can't, you can't lay back like that. So I started, you know, you know, I started listening and just hearing how, how they were phrasing and, and trying to, to match that energy. So yeah, it was, it was different, man. It was a lot different than what I was used to. Uh, um, you know, I think in, in, in Philly, 
you know, it's, it's started to become that, that saying where you're like, you're a big fish in a little pond. And so when you get to New York, it's like, you're a small fish in this huge pond and you got to sink or swim. So, uh, so yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was challenging, you know? And then I went from like Roy to playing, uh, with the Mingus band, which was, was another vibe because it was like, um, you know, all that music that he wrote, but now you're pushing a big band. So mm-hmm. now you got to really, you got to really bring that intensity and that fire because they're relying on that. You know, you know, if the, if the beat is soggy and, 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 and lagging, you're going to make the whole band drag. So, you know, those cats, and they were all older than me. I was, I was 19 or 20. So they were on me from the jump, you know, cause they're like, who's this young cat coming in here? Why is he coming in? Why, why is he touring with this band? You know? So it was like, I had to really get in there and make my statement. So yeah, it was, it was, you know, it was a bit challenging. That's where I first saw you. I think it was a IAJE conference. The Mingus band was performing at it was the first time oh, I saw right. you. That had to have been 99, maybe. Yeah. Like yeah. Na- yeah. 99. Yeah. So how did you get on the radar of Roy and, whoever would have hired you for the Mingus band. Like, what were you doing to get seen in the early days? Um, I was going to a lot of sessions, man. You know, there was a mm-hmm. session, every, a weekly session at a, in uh, Brooklyn called Dean Street. Uh, and everybody came out to those sessions. You know, I was also going to Smalls. You know, Roy, if he was in town, he was always, uh, he was always coming down to Smalls. Can you still see me? Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. He was always coming to smalls and, and, um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, we would, we would play together. Um, mm. and, and, um, you know, so he got to hear me there and then, um, and then I'm trying to think like, I, man, it was just, you know, was, you know, this scene is like really word of mouth. So, uh, so, um, you know, it's like, you know, once, once somebody hears you, the word is out. Have you checked out this new cat in uh in, in Philly, man? He's he's killing from Philly, he's killing, you know what I mean? So it was kind of like that thing. So um so my first uh I think the first time Roy heard me was actually at Smalls. And um he I think maybe I took his number or he took my number. And um he didn't re- re- really remember me, but he, 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 he remembered the, he, he remembered that he had a number. So he called me. I was, I was still in school. Actually, he called me and, um, and I was living off campus at the time. And so he called and he's like, I'm looking for Jonathan Blake. And then I guess he asked the, um, the cat who picked up the phone. He's like, man, explain to me what he looks like, you know, and he's not a remember. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so I guess you know, I guess my uh my roommate gave him, you know, a description of what I look like. He's like, Oh yeah, that's the cat. So he's like, um, you know, tell him to tell him to, uh, to come to this rehearsal. You know, we're gonna do a rehearsal. So um there was a place called there there's a place, it's still here. It's it was called the Jazz Gallery. And uh, at the time it was on Hudson Street. And this is before they started doing concerts and and becoming what it is now. So um, back then it was like a rehearsal space for Roy. It was like where his management company was set up and it was just a a space for him. It had a piano and um, you could go there and just rehearse. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. We kind of rehearsed and then... uh, you know, he had, he heard me and he was on me. Like I said earlier, he was on me immediately. Like keep that temple up. Don't drag. Um, so that's, that's how I kind of started playing with him. And then um, simultaneously, I was, I was working with a big band led by uh, Oliver Lake. Uh, he had a big band and Oliver, uh, I got referred to Oliver through uh, Oliver lived right in, in, in Montclair, New Jersey. So uh, you know, me being at William Patterson mm-hmm. was so close. So I think either he came to school or um, one of maybe one of the instructors at at, at William Patterson. I think it was Steve Touré because Steve Touré was teaching there, and, and Steve also lived in in Montclair. So I think he had recommended me. So uh, I started going to Oliver's house in Montclair and rehearsing the big band music, and that was kicking my behind because 
you know, I wasn't the strongest reader at the time. So he really, he really got, and, and with his music, everything was kind of like through composed. So it was like, you had to read everything, like mm. everything was put on there for meeting. It wasn't like trying to, you know, kind of like, you couldn't, you couldn't halfway do it. So I, uh, you know, so I, I would rehearse with him and then, and then, you know, maybe a few months later, I started playing with the big band and the big band was John's one of the saxophonists was John Stubberfield. So John heard me and recommended me to, uh, Sue Mingus said, man, there's this young kid, uh, who's been playing in this big band. So Sue actually called me and asked if I wanted to come down and, 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 um, listen to the music and, and, and maybe sit in. And I remember I said, sure. I, yeah, I would love to. And I didn't come down the week that I said I was going to come down. And I got a call like the next day, mm. like, listen, uh, when we invite you, you need to, you know, you need to, you need to make an appearance. And I was like, Oh man, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't be doing this. I, I don't want to get that type of reputation. So the following week I came down and heard the band. I think they let me sit on one tune or something like that. And, uh, and then, um, you know, maybe a few weeks later I had, uh, I had got, I, I got asked to play one of the, the Thursday nights there and I, I came and did it. It was, it was a trip, man. I, I, <laughs> I remember the first gig I had done, a. um, uh, you know, I, I handled the business correctly. So I, I told them, you know, I could, I could do the, I could probably do that Thursday night, but I'm coming from another gig just to let you know uh, that I could be a, a tad bit late. And Sue said it was cool. So, um, so I did the, I did this other gig and then I rushed down uh, to the Fez, which was under the time cafe um, in, in Greenwich village. And I was a tad bit late. The band was already up there. So they were already kind of vibing me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then I came in and I hit, you know, and I knew the music. But then I remember, like, on the break, Sue was kind of, like, going in on me and was like, why are you late? And I said, Sue, I had talked to you, you know, days before that, letting you know that I was going to be, I was coming from another gig. I had already had this gig prior to you asking me. And then, and she was like, oh, yeah, that's right. So then she kind of made it right with the rest of the band because the band was pissed, you know, <laughs> rightfully so, because they didn't know what was going on. They are like, okay, this new drummer, now he's late. You know, on top of this, mm -hmm. so um, so she made it right with everybody, and, and it was cool. But uh, and so I started working with them. Um, I guess that would have been September of uh, September or November of '98, and stayed with them for like ten years. No kidding! Wow, who was in the band before you? Uh, another Philadelphian, Gene Jackson was playing drums, okay. and uh, and also Adam Cruz. Okay. Uh, you know, and I, you know, I've known Adam for, for a while then. And, and Adam was kind of one of the cats who, when he was playing, I would go down and see the band. So I remember Adam, we were walking maybe back to my car or something like that, or maybe, no, no, maybe we were walking to catch a cab. Cause I don't think I even had a car when I first joined the band. Um, and Adam, Adam just hit me up. He's like, man, would you be into doing the band? I said, yeah, yeah. You know, he was getting ready to start touring with, um, David Sanchez and they were mm -hmm. going to be back for a minute. So he was like, man, you know, the gig is yours if you want to do it. So that's, you know, so once he gave me his blessings, I kind of started doing it, you know, uh, full time. So yeah, Gene was one of the drummers in it. Uh, yeah. Adam Cruz. There were a couple of people that, you know, would rotate and do the gig. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there was like, it was amazing because there were so many, um, you know, cats there that that had their own bands you know like you know philip harper randy brecker were in the trumpet section the sax section was like you know one week it would be seamus and chris potter you know so mm -hmm. i was meeting all these cats and and then in turn like they would ask me to join their band so uh so uh you know it was it was this whole melting pot and and and, and, and networking that was going on uh inside that band so Man, it's like the perfect starter gig. Get into a oh, big band. Oh man, it was it was amazing. <laughs> you know, because they she had all the cats coming. I mean, the band, the front. I remember the 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 section that I would usually play with the sax section was like Ronnie Cuber, uh, Seamus Blake, uh, Steve Slagle or Alex Foster, Vincent Herring, John Stubblefield or Chris Potter, 
Mark Turner would come in there. Trombone sections were like Conrad Herwig, mm-hmm. uh, Frank Lacey, um, Luis Bonilla, uh, you know, so all these. And then the rhythm section was killing. It was like Boris Kozlov, Dave Kikowski, or or John Hicks and, and Andy McKee. So it was just like, man, we were, you know, it was it was it was just an amazing experience. The trumpet session, um, you know, Randy Brecker, uh, Earl Gardner, Philip Harper, Kenny Rampton. I mean, it just it rotated. There was always, you know, Ryan Kaiser was coming in there. So it was always like the top uh, tier musicians. So, you know, it was all it was nothing for me to you know get called to do something else outside of that because all those cats had working bands Mm -hmm. most part so yeah it was a great networking opportunity all right we can't do a podcast about gear without talking about the evolution of your drum set ah there we go is so strange it looks so comfortable but it's so unusual so tell me how you landed on the because it's anyone listening doesn't know jonathan's kid it's completely flat everything Mm -hmm. is flat even the symbols and the symbols are even angled away from you a bit a bit, but you know, when because if you sit up the way I do, like I sit up super high, so it's almost like they're level too, like they're kind of like, uh, mm. even though they're a bit away from but because I'm over it, it, it makes it seem like everything is flat. So, uh, the setup actually was you know gradual, <laughs> of yeah. course. You know, I, I set up, uh, quote unquote, normal, uh, normally like in, in college, but then I started experimenting in college, it's like, man, I want to figure out if I can. Uh, execute what I'm trying to go after a lot more comfortably. Because I, what I was noticing is like when I was playing up here, I was exerting a lot more energy and I, you know, I felt like myself getting tired and and not being able to like, you know, play for longer periods of time. So I was like, man, how can I do this and feel more comfortable? And then I started thinking about, you know, my days of playing marching band in high school. I played snare drum. So the snare was always on a harness and was kind of right by my chest area. And I so got used to like playing right there. It was like, man, everything was so easy to execute because it was right there. So it's like, man, I wonder if I could, you know, try that same thing. And then I started looking at videos of, you know, early drummers like, you know, Chick Webb and 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 those cats and and even, you know, even people like uh, you know, Buddy Rich. And and what I noticed is that, man, their their symbols were always flat. Mm-hmm. You know, like they, you know, everything was right there. So I was like, man, I wonder if I can do that same thing. So what I started doing is ex- first experimenting with the toms, lowering the toms to where everything was even. And I was like, man, this this is cool. You know, this feels good. You know, and I started slowly uh, raising the stool um, so that I could kind of be over the instrument. I was like, man, because when you're over it, it's like you have the economy of motion and, and you're not fighting against the instrument. It's kind of like you're working with the instrument. So then I was like, all right, let me try to, this feels good. Let me see if I, if I bring the symbols down, if this, if this will work. And man, it just turned into something that like completely made sense to me and felt like at home, like, you know, mm-hmm. I could close my eyes and just know where everything is and, and, and feel like super comfortable. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I started equating it to like, you know, when you see a vibraphonist or a pianist, they're kind of over their instrument and they're not going all the way over here to reach for something. Everything is kind of within arm's length, you know, mm-hmm. like, you know, the, you know, I couldn't imagine like a vibraphonist, like trying to play the instrument up here, like everything <laughs> is like right here. So I'm like, man, I have to try to see the, you know, see if I can do the same thing with the, you know, with the drums. And when I got down there, I was like, man everything just felt so fluid and so easy to, to execute. And it was just like, you know, it was just like, kind of like, man, how come I didn't do that earlier? It was like that aha moment. It's like, mm. man, it takes so long for me to get to this. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, now it's funny cause now it's become a thing. Like, you know, I'll get calls from places I've played and then, you know, from different musicians who played there the next day or like, They'll send me pictures and like, yeah, I see who was here. And I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> right. I was there. Yeah, I was, you know, I remember, um, you know, one, we were we were actually in school around the same time. Um, uh, Mark, Juliana, we were playing opposite of each other, like two days, like maybe two days after each other. I think I had played. Um, I think the place was LPR. I had played maybe a couple of days before that. And then I get a text a couple of days later with a photo. He's like. 
So you were here, weren't you? And I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. they hadn't changed it since I left. So I was like, I know who was here. It was it was hilarious. So it's become a kind of a, a running thing, like everybody knows. But, you know, it just for me, it's just, you know, even I even I tell my students, like, look, this is what works for me. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work for you. But, you know, I always tell them, like, look, you have to find what's comfortable and what works. And to yeah. me, that's that's kind of where it came. And, you know, so far it's it's been cool. It feels comfortable. Yeah, you're not going to have shoulder problems, I don't think. But that's oh. uh, <laughs> no, problems, no shoulder problems. Knock on wood. So sitting that high, do you play heel up or heel down on the pedals? I play heel down on the bass drum and heel up on the hi hat. Okay, so your right foot's kind of anchoring your your body in a way. I mean, how are you balancing when you sit? Yeah, but it, I yeah, I kind of probably rely a little more heavily on the on the right foot, so it's kind of like balancing it so that I have uh, you know so that I'm not feeling like I'm going to fall. Like I don't feel unbalanced. Mm. Um, and it's not, it's not it, oddly enough, like, even though I sit up high, it's not to the point where like, if I stretch my legs, I can't reach the pedals. So yeah. there's, you know, I do feel grounded in a way like, I, you know, it, you know, I don't ever feel like, Oh man, I'm sitting too high. Like I, I feel unbalanced. If, you know, if it's that, then I, you know, then I might spiral it down a little bit, but for the most part it's it's always, um, I always feel pretty grounded and, and centered. You know, so. Do you feather the bass drum? Uh, I used to more when I was younger mm -hmm. uh, because that was how I learned. You know, that's how, you know, a lot of the, the older musicians you know, who I was studying with, you know, taught, you mm -hmm. know, taught feather, you know, kind of have like this, uh, like if this, the bass drum kind of have about this much space in between the bass, the bass drum and the beater. So that's very light. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so I learned it and, you know, it depends. Like sometimes uh, I'll break it out if, you know, if I feel that, you know, I need a little more bottom. Um, you know, the, the trick is for me, it's like, or, you know, the trick about that is 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 being felt, not heard. So mm -hmm. that's what I always tell, a, tell my students, like, you know, sometimes they start doing it and it's like, no, it's way too heavy. You know, like I'm not supposed to hear it. I'm supposed to just feel it. So that was that. That was the thing that I learned early on. So, um, but it, I don't necessarily do it as much as I used to. Mm -hmm. Now, what about, um, I, I struggle with, with, cause I have a little bob kit here in my studio now. Oh, it's with an 18 inch drum tuned up, getting it to be articulate. And I'm starting mm -hmm. to now bury the beater a bit, which I think is maybe against the rules, but what are your <laughs> thoughts on that? Like that's how yeah. I'm getting articulation. Yeah, I see. I can see that. I mean, sometimes I, you know, I actually go the opposite way with with 18s and I'm, I'm mainly I mainly play them like I um, I'll tend to tune a little bit lower, mm. you know, than maybe most people might do um, mainly because I want to I want to hear I want to be able to. To hear the bass drum, you know, or hear the fuller sound of the bass drum um, without um having to hit so hard, like if I wanted to, you know, do something. So like, if I'm going for like some accents or something like that, I want to be able to hear it um, without having to play it so hard. So uh, for me, I, um, yeah, I tend to go a little lower and maybe put like a little, uh, maybe a little towel sometimes mm -hmm. uh, in between the, the the bass drum pedal and the, and the, and the, um, and, and the bass drum itself to kind of give that, that attack so that, you know, so that it's heard, um, but not so like, but not so like overpowering, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, also what I started doing to, to help with uh, the actual attack um, is I started doing more like, like a coated, not, I'm sorry, like a, a clear pinhead on the front, you know, on the, on the beater side mm -hmm. and then a, and then coated on the back. And to me, I get that full sound of, of the bass drum a lot of times. And a lot of times when it's like that, I don't necessarily have to put the towel in because, um, you know, I feel like I can actually hear the hear the sound of the bass drum a lot clearer. Um, you know, for me, it's like, you know, like I think you're trying to like you're saying, like you're, you're striving for that clarity. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I started doing that, I uh, I was able to to execute and hear the bass drum a lot more clearer than I was before. Like before I felt like, Oh shoot, it's getting buried by the other toms or whatever. And I have to play it a lot harder to get, you know, to get the definition out. But now with this, 
I'm able to get more of the um, of the actual clarity of, of the drum itself without actually without even having to hit it that hard. Hmm. So, so when you say tune lower, how how low are we going? <laughs> well, I usually I mean I usually tune in in fourth. Okay. Starting with the bass drum. So if the bass drum's uh, F floor time, yeah, I use two floor times. So um, the 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 floor time after that would be a B flat. You know, and then you know, and then kind of go up from there. Mm-hmm. You know? So all kind of either either minor thirds or or fourths, but usually fourths. Okay. Uh, and um, so I you know I try to I try to stay with the F. You know, sometimes I'll move it up to uh, mm-hmm. you know to a G or an A, mm-hmm. uh, uh, depending on you know on the on the type of kit that I'm using. But what I found for me, and maybe I'm nerding out a little bit, but like with the Yamaha drums, for some reason, like when I tune the bass drum to an F, it it seems to sing a lot more. You know what I mean? Mm. I I don't know why that is. Maybe I don't know what, if that's the frequency or whatever. But for some reason, whenever I've tuned it to an F, it 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 sounds full and it, and it, and and I have that clarity that I that I look for. Um, so I think I have mine at an F. I want to check it. Do you have perfect yeah, pitch? Check it out. I don't. I don't have perfect pitch. I you know I have great relative pitch, mm. but I don't have I don't have perfect pitch. So sometimes I'll I'll you know I'll ask Kenny or whoever I'm playing with to play an F on the on the on the piano, or I'll, I have this thing called clear tune on, mm-hmm. on my phone, and I'll just use the pitch from there and just kind of tune it to there. Are you making it. most of your adjustments to the batter side or both? Uh, mainly to the batter side. Okay. Yeah. Batter side. I mean, I, you know, I do, I do mess with both, but usually it's the batter side. Um, with the other drums, I'm, I'm messing with both usually. Mm. I mean, unless, unless the, unless the bass drum itself is really like, you know, it's just taken out of the box or something like that and the heads were just put on there, you know, and I have to adjust everything. But usually if, uh, if it's, you know, if it's like a rental and it's been played a bit, I can just get away with, you know, just tuning, tuning the, uh, the batter side and getting it to where I need to get it to. So what is your personal kit? I know you play a lot of house kits and rentals, but what is your kit? Uh, so um, I'm endorsed with Yamaha. So I play their, um, the, 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 the series that I like is the uh, Yamaha Maple Custom Absolute. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they started making those like in, well, like in the 90s. And then they kind of redefined, you know, re revamped them like in the early 2000s, I think, mm-hmm. like late 90s, early 2000s. So I have a set of those, uh, like a, a, a black sparkle that I mm-hmm. use. Cool. And then um, a couple of years ago now, they they sent me a, a, a new kit, which is uh, which is a new Maple Custom Absolute, but it's a hybrid of, of two different woods. And I use that sometimes, too. And that's a great sounding instrument, too. But I also have a lot of different kits. Like mm-hmm. so, I have uh, I have one of the um, old Sonar Light kits, the the Phonics. Oh yeah, yeah, and that sh- those drums are freaking amazing. They just you talk about sing, they sing. So sometimes I use those. Um, I have an old Gretsch kit that I use that I go back to sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, I would say for the main kit, um, uh, it's it's the Yamaha Maple Custom. I was just talking to my my buddy Tom about Kenny Clark sound, and he was like, "Yeah, it's a sonar kit. That's the sound. That's the big oh, old man. snare drum sound that he got." Oh yeah, man. Those 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 drums are special, man. Like I have a couple set of those. I have a set of highlights, uh, like Canary Yellow, like almost like a, a Tony Williams that I got from uh, Clarence Penn. Mm. Uh, you know that I got when I was still in high school, and then I don't know if you remember this. Uh, it's actually still around. It's just in a different location. The Systems Two, this recording studio. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So when they were when they were uh, moving out of the place that they that they were in, uh, they were selling all the gear. And mm. one of the drum sets there that everybody played on, you know, for all those recordings like Criss Cross and all these other various recordings, was the sonar kit that was um, that was given to them by uh, Marvin Smitty Smith. Mm-hmm. So when they were um, when they were selling the gear, they were like they were trying to get rid of everything like quick, fast, in a hurry. So, uh, so 
the owner was like, look, I'll give you a deal with these drums. Just get them out of here. <laughs> and, you know, and what he gave them to me for, I was like, are you serious? He's like, yep. <laughs> you know, and I got like, let's see, I got a 22, I have an 18, I have a, a, a 15, a 14, a 13, and a 12, and I think a 10, Tom. Uh, they didn't have the snare, but I got, you know, I got all the drums and they just, I mean, they just sound so beautiful, man. You know, it's one of the things they've been played for a long time. So they, they mm. have a vibe to it. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I break those out when I, when I, you know, when I need to really go, go in, I, you know, I use them on a record. I use them on a record. Uh, who this record was, it? Oh, this record I did with, uh, with, uh, Kenny Barron and, and Dave Holland and just, man, they sound from the, from the first note. I was just like, "Oh man, this is this is heaven." <laughs> so yeah, so uh, those those drums, man. I I yeah, those are my babies. I love those drums. So how often do you play a twenty two? Not not too often, man. I you know it was funny. I went to go see a friend of mine last week, and he was playing an eighteen uh, sonar. Uh, I went to go see Ty Sean. Sorry, last week he was playing mm. with uh, with uh, VJ Iyer and, and Linda O. and I took a picture of the kit because he had the he had the the sonar. I think it's the phonics he had, and and he hit that first note on the bass drum. I was like, "Oh man, he's gonna make me go pull out my." He had the eighteen, but I was like, "Man, he's gonna make me go pull out my twenty too." And I'm like, "This thing sounded so great." You know, sometimes when you're away from you, you tend to forget how how great these drums you know were made and how great they sound. So I was like, "Man, I'm gonna have to." I told him, you know, we were hanging after the set. And I was like, man, you're going to make me bring out these drums again. I, you know, <laughs> I kind of shy away from using them because they're so heavy. Yeah, yeah. They just, they, they just sound so amazing, man. There's not, you know, there's not too many companies out there that that make drums that special. So, um, yes, yeah, so I might have to, I had to go and revisit those. But, yeah, those, <laughs> those are great sound drums. I, yeah, I don't, I, I wish I could, I wish I had, you know, the opportunity to, to break out the 22 more often. Cause you know, I, you know, I, when I started playing drums, you know, I wasn't playing quote unquote jazz. It was, I was doing a lot of like, um, top 40 gigs and, and R&B, mm-hmm. you know, like I, I remember I would do these kind of like house parties and, uh, in Philly. And I remember like, you know, a couple of times doing these house parties and, and quest love was the DJ. Mm. You know, so it was like, you know, I'm playing with him, you know, so it was like I was breaking out the big bass drum because, you know, they needed that bottom. So, you know, so I get, you know, I got used to doing that. So it's kind of weird not to have, you know, not to have these drums, but not to get and get a chance to play them as much. So hey, maybe I didn't. Just, didn't Tony use a 22 in the 80s? I yeah, mean, hey. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I might have to. I might just have to make the opportunities myself and just start <laughs> I like yeah, I don't know how you'll deal with your setup with a big bass drum like that. That's going to be a little weird. Be a little weird. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that's going to work. But, uh, well, tell me about your cymbals. I, I noticed in a bunch of videos you've got, looks like a customized left side ride. What you know? What, what's your setup? Um, well, for a long time, kind of now I'm in between things. I, I was with Zildjian for a long time and I kind of left them. Um, but I, you know, for a long time I was using... Um, these spizz, spizz symbols. Mm. I was using 22 on the right, 21 on the left, um, and and a uh, and a uh, a prototype from Zildjian on the on the far right. Uh, um, it was something that they were making, I think, for for Jeff Ballard at the time, and it was a very unique symbol because they drilled it um, two other spots uh, besides the center. They drew they they you know, they drilled a hole to the left of the, of the center and to the right of the center. Mm. Basically the idea was to be able to hang it in different spots and really change the set oh, and change. Really? You know, yeah. So it was amazing because hang, you know, when I would experiment hanging it in those different spots, it literally changed the sound drastically. Like you know, it sounded like a completely different symbol. Mm-hmm. And basically they were trying to, um, they were trying to, duplicate he had this old k uh, jeff had this old k that was uh that had gotten cracked and basically he had it fixed and uh whoever fixed it bolted it bolted with these you know metal bolts to stop the the spreading of the crack 
but it changed the symbol and it really got this very unique kind of like tight sound. You mm-hmm. hear it on like all these different records that he did with Kurt Rosenwinkel and various other people. So they were trying to trying to duplicate that. And 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 basically when they did that, when they drilled it in those different spots, it really, it really sounded, you know, kind of close to what he had. Um, but they never really brought it out to, you know, to the public. So I, I got one and had some rivets, you know, had some uh, rivets put in and I, and I used it as my third symbol and it really, you know, it was almost like having, uh, three symbols in one. Mm-hmm. Cause like, sometimes if I wanted to, I would just hang it and, and from, you know, from either side and just it would change the whole sound. So it was almost like having three different symbols uh and one so that was that was on the far right and then i used uh 14 inch k constantinople hi-hats mm-hmm. and, and then i used uh uh the one that i still use that hangs all the way to the right is a boomy wang made by a company called hammer Rex. right yeah so that's like a signature vibe yeah, now isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah that's my vibe right there so that's the that that's kind of what has remained and and now I'm I'm working on some difference. I have a I have a cat and um Austria has been making me some symbols. And then I also been in talks with um uh the folks up at uh Istanbul and mm-hmm. uh and uh the cats at Istanbul sent me a couple things that I'm I'm really starting to to dig. They're starting to change. They, I think they were right off the you know assembly block when you know when I got them so you know right off the floor. So you know it takes a minute to kind of like you know, break them in. So they're slowly getting, you know, broken in. I'm going to think I'm going to use them this weekend. Uh, I have a gig out out in um, Jackson, Mississippi. Mm. I'm going to use them on that. You know, so what um, do you look for in like a primary ride symbol? What do you need from it? I need clarity, man. For Mm. me, it's like, you know, I love being able to hear the stick sound, you know, even if it's a darker, uh, lighter symbol, I still want to, you know, be able to dig in and still hear that stick sound. So that's what I kind of go after. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I'm look, you know, when I'm playing, I, I tend to go to gravitate more for the the darker symbols, mm-hmm. uh, um, not so bright, not so tenty. Um, I kind of go for the darker sound, um, just because that's what I, you know, got used to hearing, like with Elvin and and and, and cats like that. And I, you know, I just always gravitate and fell in love with that sound. So my symbols are not; they're usually not too bright. Um, the dark, but you can always hear the definition of the stick. So, um, you know, and I, you know, I always experiment with like playing super slow, make sure that I can hear the clarity and then, you know, and then really play super fast and see if I can still hear the clarity or does it get washed away by, by the uh, symbol itself. Mm-hmm. So, um, if it doesn't get washed away and I can still hear the clarity of the stick, then I know that I'm onto something. And so, so now, um, I'm working pretty much with the same size, just, you know, just, you know, just Istanbul. So Istanbul sent me uh, a 30th anniversary, kind of like an older style that they used to make, uh, um, which, you you know, which is not really like, uh, you can't really see the label, but it, it has like kind of like that, that, that older style that they mm-hmm. you know, older style, like old K type of vibe. So that I have a 22 of that, a, a 20 on the right. Um, and then I have this 21, um, which is a, I think it's not, it's not a 30th anniversary. It's a different one, but that actually sounds cool. It's a, it's a dark one. And then I have a set of uh, 15 hi hats. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, 30th anniversary also. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like digging them, you know, it's taking a minute to, you know, they, they, they're still sitting in my, in my studio, you know, just every day I'm just kind of working them out and, you know, feeling them out and, you know, spinning them around, see where I, you know, see where I feel comfortable the most with or where it sounds good to me. So it just takes a minute. I mean, you know, the spizzes that I, that I used to use, um, it took a while for them to break in too. So, Mm -hmm. uh, so I know it's going to be the same with these symbols, but I, I kind of wanted to stop traveling with the spizzes um, because now they just become collector's items. And I'm, you know, I just fear like if, if they get lost or broken, that's, yeah, it's no replacing those. So, mm-hmm. um, so I was like, man, I got to find something that is comparable to that and where I won't feel like 
so gutted if 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 something is to happen to him. So um, so yeah, so I um, so I'm 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 kind of dealing with that, and in between that, there's a uh, as I mentioned before, there's a guy, cat in Austria that I met um, uh, this past summer, mm-hmm. uh, who's also a great drummer, and he's and he's uh, and, and a great cymbal smith. He's he kind of just kind of fell into it. He started experimenting with making cymbals and. Um, he, you know, he's, he's, he's like me, he loves Elvin. So he's, he's been making these, uh, these Elvin prototypes of the love Supreme symbol. Oh, wow. That's the Holy Grail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so he's, uh, so he, he's made me a couple samples of them. Man. They're, they're pretty amazing. So I, I kind of switched between those two. Um, and he has these rivets that he used that are, especially in the one that I really like he in there. Um, they're like aluminum. Hmm. I had never really seen them before. And they, man, it's like the, it's like that perfect balance. Like they're not too heavy and they, and they, uh, but they really make the symbol sing. So I, mm-hmm. I, I enjoying it. And I remember um, this is like back in October, I did a rehearsal with, uh, with Ravi for this gig we had at, uh, at the Vanguard and I brought the symbol and I was like, yo man, check out this new symbol. Uh, this cat modeled it after this album. And, you know, of course, he know that simple. He played, you know, he played with Elvin, but he knows those records, you know. So uh, he said he heard it. And he's like, it's a little brighter. And I was like, yeah, it's a little brighter. <laughs> yeah, a little brighter. And then I think maybe we put on a Love Supreme and just heard, you know, I heard the symbol. I was like, yeah, it's a little brighter. But, uh, you know, the, the the vibe is there. The idea is there. And it'll, it'll also change up, too. So, yeah, yeah. So between those two things, you know, those two people, I'm, I'm trying to find – uh, a happy medium. Yeah. What does your stick choice play into it? Um, I I use Vader. Uh, I'm endorsed with Vader, and I use this model called the um, Super Jazz Sugar Maple. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like I like maple sticks. A lot of a lot of cats prefer hickory, but for some reason, like for me, I love I love the feeling of the maple, and just also the way it you know responds on the symbol. Like I always feel like. Um, you know, the stick doesn't get lost in there. And I, mm-hmm. I don't know, for me, it just feels so comfortable to play. So um, if I do use Hickory, I, I do, um, like I, said, I mainly play this super jazz, but also sometimes I'll switch and I'll use a nylon tip, which is actually Hickory, which is a, a Manhattan 7A. Mm-hmm. I use those sometimes. And then sometimes I'll use, like if it's a really like gig where you can't really, you have to, keep it to like a, a very minimal volume. I'll use these um, sticks called, what are they called? They're, they're also by Vader. What are they called? Um, I think they're called bop sticks or something like this. It's mm. a really small tip, almost like a bolero tip. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, sometimes I'll use those um, to kind of keep the clarity, but also uh, but also be able to, to keep the volume down if it's something that I have to play really soft. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's it's usually the the sugar maple, and um, I've been playing those the super jazz sugar maple, and I've been playing those for years. I think, um, I think it was Otis Brown or or Kendrick Scott had kind of introduced me to those, and mm-hmm. I think it was Kendrick actually. Kendrick was like, because I was I was you know messing around with different sticks, and he was like, man, try these out. You know, he's like, I think you might like them, and then he gave me a pair, and I started using them. I'm like, man, these feel great. So, um, you're yeah, the so second that, person in a couple of weeks that have said those are the, the sticks for them. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it must be the, yeah. the secret weapon. Ah, no, they <laughs> feel really comfortable, and they're you know, and they're and they're they're consistent and sturdy, man. Like you know, like I can play super light with them, but I can also play dig in and play super hard, and they don't break, man. Mm. You know, it's very rarely, it's very rare that I break sticks anyway, but. You know, I noticed when I was playing some other sticks, um, they would break a lot easier. But mm. you know, it's like, man, they're they're sturdy, man. And I just, yeah, I just love the way it feel when I when I'm playing them, man. It's just, you know, always I'm always able to hear the stick sound and and um, yeah, they just feel. I don't know, for me, they just feel good. Like gripping them, it feels it feels really good. I want to talk about. I feel like this is your superpower. You're able to play really quiet, really intense. And with a lot of like interaction, mm-hmm. uh, two part question: How do you develop a light touch? <laughs> and 
And then uh-huh. two, how do you play with that kind of busier approach without getting in the way of what's going on? Like what's, what's going on in your head? Well, for me, it's like, I'm always, I was telling somebody this yesterday because they, they, they asked me the same question. And I said, you know, the one thing that I, that I say is like, I, you know, coming up and having to play behind a violinist, having to play behind my dad, who sometimes if we were, you know, rehearsing at, at the house, he wasn't using the amp. So mm-hmm. it was like, you know, I had to play and I had to play with a certain volume so that I could, so that I could hear him, you know, hear the articulation, hear the melodies. So one of the things he, he, he stressed to me was like, um, you want to be one of these drummers that can, can hear the melody. So if you can't hear the melody, that means you're playing too loud. Mm-hmm. So, so I always, I got in my head about, like gravitating and listening to the melody early on. And that really helped me to refine my touch. Uh, so um, I started practicing, uh, I would say like maybe my maybe my senior year of high school going into college about, uh, especially in college I started working on, it was about like being able to play what I could play at the time, but playing it at half the volume, mm-hmm. still feeling comfortable. So I would just I would sit there all day, like play one phrase, you mm-hmm. know, for okay. hour. Uh, play it, you know, play it at different volumes until it felt comfortable. And you know, and you have you have to be honest within yourself because you know, like if something feels comfortable or if it doesn't. So if it didn't feel comfortable, it's like all right, it's not there yet. So I would just continue to do it, mm-hmm. uh, you know. And I would say, okay, if I can play it here, I got to be able to play it here and still feel comfortable and. And then even take it down another notch and still and, and still feel comfortable. So that's what I would do, man. And, you know, because my idea behind it, too, was like, um, I want to be able to play in any venue. Yeah. Uh, uh, whether it's, a, you know, whether it's a concert hall, whether it's a place that's surrounded all by glass, you know, like anything. Like, I want to be able to play in any situation and still feel comfortable. So, um, you know, you know, if. If I can play in the clubs, I want to be able to play in a in a in a in a theater. I want to be able to play in in a concert hall and, and still feel comfortable. And 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 that's what I started doing. I just started started really like working on touch. Sometimes I, um, you know, I don't, man, where are my sticks? I don't have a stick handy. But I was going to show you like sometimes I um, what I would do too is to kind of deaden the stick sound. I would move my hand up mm-hmm. further to the, to the, you know, almost like to the middle to, of the stick to kind of deaden the, the stick sound a lot so that I, you know, so that I don't come up as much so that uh, I'm taking down the volume too. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a trick that I, that I, I saw um, one of my friends, uh, Marcus Baylor do sometimes mm-hmm. playing with uh, Cassandra Wilson and Cassandra would want to like, you know, pin drop quiet sometimes. And, you know, he found that, but she still would want you to play with sticks. So a lot of times she was like, okay, how do I do that? So he, you know, he started like moving his hand up further on the stick, you know, to the middle of the stick so that he could deaden the sound a little bit. So I would do that sometimes too. Mm. But then I, I started thinking, man, and, it, you know, and it was just me. I was like, man, I feel like I should, ha- I should be able to, you know, do that even if I'm playing, you know, towards the butt of the stick. I don't, I feel like, I don't want to have to cheat to get the you know, right yeah. now. So I started just, yeah, it's like, okay, if it's, if I can play that phrase super forte, then I got to work on playing it, you know, piano, meso piano. And that's what I just kept doing until it just it felt super comfortable to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and for me, it's like doing that. It just, you start to hear different things, man. Like you start to, you know, like you start to really, um, you start to really hear what's going on around you. You know, sometimes it's so easy for us to, this is a powerful instrument. So it's so easy for us to, to, uh, to overtake the band, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So it was like, when I took a step back and started really like, you know, you know, bringing the volume down, it was like, man, I could really, I could really hear what was going on all around me. And, um, and I was like, man, you know, I started thinking like, dang, I'm playing this loud. I've been playing this loud sometimes. And I'm like, 
I'm missing out on all this beauty that's going on around me. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, so I started, I started really just being more mindful of it, like, and really just trying to, you know, like play some of my bebop phrases that I learned early on and, and, and say, okay, look, I'm going to, I'm going to play them same phrases, but I'm going to play them half the volume. Mm-hmm. And then, and then it just started, it, something just started to click. It just started to work. Um, and I, you know, I started, you know, going out and hearing drummers and, and really studying their, their, their touch and their technique behind it, you know, going to see, you know, Brian Blade or going to see uh, Bill Stewart or going to see Clarence Penn, Greg Hutchinson. I was like, oh man, these cats, these cats have really um, refined their touch. Mm-hmm. And so that's, and, and they're able to play in any setting. So that's what I always wanted to do. So uh, that's, that's kind of how it came about. Like, uh, uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that happened overnight. It was just something that I, you know, that I consciously made, consciously made an effort to, to be aware of, mm-hmm. uh, cause you know, because of what my father used to tell me, like, if you, if you can't hear the melody, you playing way too loud. So, <laughs> now does that, yeah, that's, that's a similar, um, I think Elvin might've said, if, if you're not hearing the melody, don't listen to what anyone else is playing. Like that was his, his philosophy mm-hmm. about comping and, and kind of when you get in more of the heat of the moment of the tune, mm-hmm. are you consciously, subconsciously hearing the melody when you start getting in there with a the soloist or what, you know, what happens yeah. there? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's a constant conversation as we know. So uh, for me, it's like, I, I use the melody as, as kind of like my, my guide on how I'm going to comp. Mm-hmm. Well, so, uh, you know, so if we're taking a tune like, you know, Monk's evidence or something like that. I'm going to use bits and parts of the melody to kind of, kind of help guide me through the comping. And, and in turn, that's going to be a conversation with the rest of the people I'm playing with, because they're going to hear that and, and play off of that. You mm-hmm. know? So, so yeah, for me, my melody remains constant in, in, in everything I'm doing when, you know, when I'm playing, because this, you know, it's something that, you know, everybody can gravitate to, you know, you know, especially if it's, a memorable melody. It's something that you can, you know, you can always gravitate to. So I, I tend to just keep that in the back of my high, my head. Sometimes I'm even humming the melody, you know, while mm. I'm playing. And, 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 and then in turn, that also turns into how, uh, you know, how I base my solos. Like sometimes I'm, you know, I'm using the melody as a starting point to, to build my solo, mm-hmm. you know, you know, if I feel like, you know, if I feel like, Oh, I'm running out of ideas. I'm like, okay, let me, let me go back. You know, let me, let me start from square one and, and, and use the melody as my guide and, and build it that way. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, melody is, is so important and is key and I never want to forsake it, you know? So. How do you feel about breaking from form when you're soloing? Like, is it, do you try to keep it a form based experience or does it, is there, you know, like I get really insecure about it if I don't keep the form. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it depends. It depends on like the style. Like sometimes, um, you know, sometimes I I want I like I like the form. You know, I like keeping the form. I you know like being able to come up with ideas, um, you know, based in that form or you know based in however many bars it is. But it, it also depends on the mood. Like sometimes. I like to use that as a base and then kind of grow from there and just get away from it and, mm. and, and, and then re you know, then reintroduce it, you know? So, um, cause at the same time, like sometimes sticking so close to the form, it be, it can be, you can, it can be kind of constricting in a way. And, mm. you know, and sometimes you want to, you know, break away from those walls, so to speak, that you've built around yourself. So sometimes I'll, I'll be in the middle of a solo and I'm, you know, and I'm staying, true to the form. And then I'm like, oh, I, want, I want to get away from it. So I, I might do something where I, you know, I stretch the time out or whatever. And then, mm-hmm. you know, but at the same time, even within that, a lot of times I still know where I am if I'm, if I'm doing a form, but sometimes if you, if you've internalized the form so much where it's just like become second nature, then you can do, you can take those liberties and, and stretch the form out or stretch, stretch the bar out stretch the bottom line out or, or, you know, bring it back in. So um, it just depends. Uh, but I, you know, I don't necessarily always like to have to play the form. I, I kind of like to 
to break away from it too. Then what do you do with the band to like let them know, hey, I'm kind of going out here? <laughs> to me, that's the easiest thing. So, you know, like, so for me, if I, if I go away out of time, you know, um, or, or go beyond the, or beyond the, um, the bar lines or whatever, or the forum, um, I'll generally bring it back by, by playing the groove, you know, of, mm. of the two or, or, um, or making the idea so, so clear that they know exactly where it is. So whether that means um, playing a phrase of the melody so that they hear it and they know, mm. and they latch onto where it is, or just coming in with, you know, if it's a vamp or something, coming back in with the vamp and then they, you know, and then bringing them back in that way. Uh, you know, to me, this, you know, for us, it's, I, I think it's, it's very, it's very easy to, for, for, for artists, if they're really listening, if they, you know, if they're really in tune, you know, they're, it's really easy for them to, to quickly uh, get on or, or know where you are. Mm. So they know where to come back in. So. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up with one last question. I want to yes, send, sir. I want to send our listeners off with some listening homework. Um, ah, there you go. I feel like we studied the classic bebop, hard bop stuff so heavily. We kind of like stop at Roy and Jack and Tony. Mm-hmm. I want some suggestions for what to listen to from the modern age. Oh man, so there's a lot, man. I um, for the more modern stuff, I would definitely say um, checking out. You know, even some some of my contemporaries checking out um, some Nate Wood <laughs> mm-hmm. with Nebody. You know, checking out. Uh, you know. Cl- of course, some um, some more modern casts like you know Marcus Gilmore. Um, uh, let's see, uh, if we're talking about more open stuff, I would I would say check out some some uh, some later Barry Alchel, uh, the mm. cast don't really know about some um, some uh, even later Jack stuff, which is really open. Um, uh, some 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 of the M base stuff with like Sean Rickman and Gene and Gene Lake, um, all that stuff to me is like, you know, you get it, you can go down a rabbit hole with that kind of stuff. Mm. So I, I like I like checking out that stuff. Uh, some of Ty Sean stuff is beautiful. Uh, Paul Motion, of course, who uh, who can kind of take it more left. And uh, yeah, I mean this. It's, it's the possibilities are endless. It's, you know, for me, it's like, I don't always gravitate to that stuff. Um, but when I do, it's like, I'm in tune. So, you know, I, you know, checking out my contemporaries, uh, you know, checking out Eric Carlin, checking out uh, Mark Juliana, checking out some Nate Smith, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to me, those are some of the cats who are on the preface, you know, preferences of, 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 um, Going of taking this music to another level. So. Nice. Do you have a new record in the works? I know you just put one out last I, year, which is incredible. Yeah, Homeward Bound just came out in October uh, on on Blue Note, and um, we're 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 currently working with that and, and trying to you know set up some tours for that. And then um, we have another one in the can that uh, hopefully will come out this year, um, if not next year. Um, but hopefully, I think hopefully towards um, the latter part of this year, it should be out again. You know, Sweet. You know, um, Pentad Record, which is the group that's uh, that's on this Homeward Bound record for um, Luno. So yeah, so we're you know that stuff is kind of in the works, and we're slowly, uh, you know, this is my first major label release. So uh, so yeah, so we're just getting things together now and, and trying to. Uh, set it up for you know for the future so nice man well, congrats the, the record is beautiful everyone should Thank definitely you. check out you have a few other ones that under your name yeah um, and then i mean how would anyone who wanted to maybe take a lesson or find out where your tour dates are um is there a spot where i should send them yeah yeah if they go to uh jonathan blake.com j-o-h-n-a-t-h-a-n blake.com that is all my um it has all my scheduling information um, they can hit me up on Instagram on, um, my Instagram is it Blake? No, Jonathan Blake drums, mm-hmm. Instagram, um, Facebook is, uh, Jonathan Blake. So, uh, yeah, I'm easy. I'm easily accessible. 
Um, and they can they can find me that way if they're interested. Great. Well, thank you for sitting with uh, us. It was a good oh, man, no I'm sorry for the my tardiness. <laughs> Still getting my computer chops up, but uh, we're getting it together. That's it for this week's episode. Hope you enjoyed that chat with Jonathan. Go over to his website. That's J O H N A T H A N B L A K E dot com. Jonathan Blake dot com. There you can read more about his career. Check out some of the records he's been on and some of the records under his own name. You can keep up with his gig calendar. You can also reach out to him about possibly setting up a lesson if you're interested. Um, That's it. So have a good one and we'll see you next week.